welcome. I want to thank you all for being here with us this afternoon for what I think um, promises to be an exciting and important lecture. I want to offer a special thank you to the Reynolds Associates who are here because, of course, it is your generosity that actually makes this lecture possible. Um, this is the 31st year that we've been doing this lecture, so there's a long legacy here of bringing in the best minds from indeed across the country and across the world to um, enlighten us and to share their thoughts and vision with us. And today, we have a very interesting individual who is going to be talking with us, and it's Dr. Baron Werner. And he's going to be introduced in a few minutes by Hughes Evans, but he comes to us from Columbia University, from their College of Physicians and Surgeons, and from their School of Public Health. So with that, I think you, I'm just going to turn the program over to you and let you do the formal introduction because I know everybody's so excited about the title here that they don't want to wait any longer. Thank you, President Pearson, and thanks also to the Camellia Group and to the Office of the President of us for their generous support for today's lecture. I'm delighted to introduce Baron Lerner as the 31st Annual Reynolds Historical Lecture. Baron is a, a friend and a colleague. He is the Angelica Berry Gold Foundation Professor of Medicine and Public Health at the Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons in the Maryland School of Public Health. He received his medical degree from Columbia and his PhD from the University of Washington and has been the recipient of many prestigious awards and fellowships. A practicing general internist, he also teaches medical ethics and the history of medicine at Columbia. His commentaries may be familiar to you because he uh, is regularly featured on NPR and in, in New York, the New York Times. And his commentaries talk, talk about contemporary medical issues with a history of medicine play. His books have ranged from an examination of the experience of tuberculosis among the impoverished and homeless denizens of Skid Road to a recent examination of the experienced disease on the opposite end of the socioeconomic spectrum. His astute examination of breast cancer treatments in his book, The Breast Cancer Wars, which won many awards, showed how politics, culture, science, and med medicine and the media work together to impact breast cancer therapies and the 20th century experience of disease. His most recent book, When Illness Goes Public, Celebrity Patients and How We Look at Medicine, demonstrates the many ways that popular culture and medicine interact. Now many of us at one time or another have found ourselves reading the tragic headlines on the tabloids in the grocery store lines. And we remember the tears we shed in movies like Brian's Song or Love Story and the more recent medical dramas. Dr. Lerner brilliantly realized that this public fascination with celebrity disease and our ability to make sickness famous represents more than mere prurience on our part. He's used a historical lens and an eye trained to see the subtle underlying significance of these popular stories to teach us why these stories of celebrity patients have so much to tell us. So welcome, Karen. Thank you, uh, President Garrison, Dr. Evans, and uh, the Reynolds Fellows. I tried to make a list of everyone who's going to thank, so I could thank them, but I, I really am honored to be here. And it's such a, a wonderful lecture series and a, such a nice turnout. I'm really uh, honored. And uh, you, you really can't lose with this topic. It's very interesting, even for non-medical people. Uh, so it, it's, it's fun to get to talk about it. But I think it also raises a lot of interesting and challenging issues. So I'll forge ahead, speak about, I guess, about 40, 45 minutes, and, and definitely want to leave time for questions as well. Uh, there are lots of celebrities I won't get to cover in the actual talk. Okay, just uh, my own thank yous to uh, funders for this. If you can find funders who let you buy People Magazine and pretend it's for research, uh, I guess I was doing a pretty good job, but uh, very helpful. We'll talk about some of these people uh, and, and not get to all of them, but again, uh, lots of interesting stories. Okay, so let me do a bit of an overview and talk about some of the themes that I'm going to cover as I talk about these famous cases. So one will be the role of celebrities in new medical technologies. Uh, the media uh, has played a crucial role in uh, getting celebrity cases uh, into the forefront. 
many celebrities have become activists for diseases. So the uh, celebrity illness ties into the rise of patient activism beginning in the 1970s. And finally, uh, another thing that I'll talk about uh, more toward the end is what I call uh, the tension between N of 1 cases, in other words, anecdotal cases of celebrities, for example, and evidence-based medicine. Uh, and as I'll argue, we've sort of seen a growth of attention to both anecdotal cases and to a more scientific approach at the same time historically. Um, this is my myth slide. Um, I'm always looking for a better one, but I haven't found one yet, M-Y-T-H. Um, to remind me to tell you that a lot of the stories that I uncovered while working on this project uh, were, I guess we might sort of, sort of say, shrouded in myth. And one thing I did is I was researching, in, in a sense, was sort of chip away at, at the myths to try to understand what truly happened. But a, as I'll argue later on, as I worked more and more on the project, I realized that the myths were almost more interesting than the truth. Okay, so uh, again, a little bit of organization here. Uh, I'm going to group the famous cases I'm talking about into, ru into roughly three overlapping groups. Uh, the first are people who are famous, known to the public already, who become sick, and you can see the years there that I'll talk about. Uh, the second group will also be famous people, but instead of just having their cases presented to the public, they took it upon themselves to, in some manner, challenge the medical system that they became involved in and go public with their challenges as well. And then the third group uh, will be sick people who were not known uh, at all be before they got sick, but as a result of their illness became famous, hence the title of the talk. Um, and I, as I worked on the project, I got interested in both groups, those famous at the start and those in not famous uh, who became sick. Okay, so uh, a little uh, bit of history here before I move into the specific cases. Uh, in order to have famous cases, uh, you've got to have a way for people to learn about the famous cases. And a lot of this really begins in America in the 1920s uh, for reasons uh, that are, are pretty obvious. On the radio is certainly something that uh, is a way that people can hear in a more rapid manner about news events, whether they're celebrities or not, um, a, a large increase in uh, tabloids, which grew out of the late 19th century, but increased in the 1920s. Uh, also, newsreels, 1920s, another way that the lives of, uh, of famous people are discussed. And in a, you know, if you think of the 1920s, you think of uh, you know, Greta Garbo and Charlie Chaplin and Babe Ruth and Jack Dempsey. And, it, it really is the first time that the sort of this cult of celebrity that begins, and again, with this new technology, whatever's going on in their lives, initially not the illnesses, of course, but the other things, the movies, the sporting events, the marriages, the divorces, all that begins to come uh, public. Um, I mentioned uh, Rudolph Valentino and Harry Houdini here. I won't ask you which one that is. I assume you know. Uh, <laughs> And uh, I, I put them here only because coincidentally, both of them died uh, in the same month in 1926. Both of them died of peritonitis. Um, Valentino, the great movie star, and Harry Houdini, uh, the uh, magician. Uh, and both of their cases, because they were young and the deaths were so sudden, attracted a huge amount of media attention. We can, I'm not going to talk about those cases more specifically. But this sort of, I think, began to open the door a crack for coverage of illnesses to be uh, more acceptable. Now, they, they, they didn't really have illnesses in the sense they both got sick very quickly and died relatively quickly. But again, peering into their lives seemed to be appropriate. Uh, a little on the history of medicine, just to, uh, again, put some things into context here. Lots of changes in the era that I'm going to be talking about. Uh, discoveries, lots of new scientific information, uh, the discovery of insulin in 1920 and eventually the uh, manufacture of it, the ability to treat diabetes. Uh, antimicrobials come in in the 30s and 40s, first the sulfonamides and penicillin. Enormous uh, change in our ability to treat bacterial illnesses that formerly killed people now treatable. Uh, this led to what we might call an allure of technology. Uh, all of a sudden, 
previously fatal diseases were treatable. And as people realized that about infectious diseases, interest grew in other incurable diseases, whether it was heart disease, liver disease, kidney disease, cancer. Could we do the same for those diseases as we've done for infectious diseases? And I just put at the bottom to remind us, and I, I will be talking about experimentation a lot during this talk, um, the, the budget of the NIH and, and interest in research into these new technologies after the end of World War II starts to go up and begin to climb that we're so familiar with today. All right, let's get to the cases then. Enough of this. Um, all right, so uh, the first case, and, and this is indeed the first case that I start the book off with, is that of Lou Gehrig, and I sort of term him the first modern patient in the sense that I think a lot of the themes that I'm talking about and the themes that you see today in the story of famous patients uh, emerge in his case. So I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about Gehrig and then the way it, it got presented about his actual illness. Um, so Gehrig, as, as most of you know, um, developed amyotrophic lateral sclerosis in 1938. Uh, now, of course, known as Lou Gehrig's disease. Um, there's a lot of interesting debate about when was it that Lou Gehrig actually got sick, um, but it was probably during the 1938 season. Now, Gehrig was the first baseman for the New York Yankees. He was the Iron Horse, had played in more consecutive games than any other player. So the irony, of course, that Gehrig develops a terrible neurological disease uh, in, in 1938, um, I, I won't go into more detail except to say just you find fascinating things when you're researching this. Gehrig went to spring training in 1939. Uh, in the winter, he almost certainly had the disease in 1938. He goes home over the winter between 1938 and 1939. He's deteriorating neurologically. He's falling down, tripping over curbs. Um, goes to spring training, uh, amazingly, where everyone's basically in denial, they call it a slump, etc. Uh, starts the season at first base, balls are rolling under his glove, it's terrible. I mean, this could never happen today, obviously, with, with television and, and, and the internet. Uh, Garrett got four hits out of the 28 at-bats. Probably the, mo the most remarkable athletic feat in history. I, I, I'd love, you know, I know the videotape of that doesn't exist, but somehow he managed to get four hits that season before finally uh, he took himself out of the lineup because he was so ill. The, the manager didn't have the guts to do it. So finally, Gehrig wins his way in June now of 1939. And again, just to show how medicine was different in those days, Gehrig took himself out of the lineup in May. He didn't go to the doctor until June when his wife was convinced he had a brain tumor and finally uh, induced him to go. Uh, but once he went there to the Mayo Clinic, uh, he was given the following diagnosis. So here's uh, June 13th to June, to June 19th. This Dr. Habine saw him after a careful and complete examination. It was found Eric is suffering from amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. There it is, New York Times front page, front page of most newspapers in the country. Uh, anyone interested in looking up amyotrophic lateral sclerosis in a neurology textbook would have found that it was an incurable neurological disease that usually resulted in death in a couple of years. Um, very severe, devastating illness. Um, I mentioned that I called Garrick the first modern patient. This is a letter, um, it's the only one I could sort of find of, of this ilk, written by Eleanor Gehrig, Lou's wife, after Lou could no longer write, to a woman who had inquired about Gehrig's ALS. So Gehrig became a touchstone for other people in the country with ALS. People wrote to him both to express sympathy, but also to find out what was Gehrig doing for his disease. So other sick people uh, wrote to him. And as you'll see as, as I talk about other cases, this is something that has become incredibly common in the lives of celebrity patients. They become identified with the disease and the public seeks them out. What was Gehrig doing? Gehrig was very aggressive patient. Um, he, at various times, now there was no known treatment for the disease as unfortunately there really still is not today. Um, Gehrig tried a series of vitamin injections to try to treat the disease. Part of the reason for this was it had been recently discovered 
at this time in medicine that several diseases not previously known to be vitamin deficiency diseases were vitamin deficiency diseases. One of the classic examples being pellagra and ice. Um, so, vitamin, which is a vitamin B3 deficiency. So they gave Gary vitamin B3, even though he obviously didn't have pellagra. And you see these other uh, things he got. Eventually, uh, I'll, you don't have to, can't see this, I, I realize, but he eventually goes into a clinical trial. 1940, this is a Dr. Wexler, a neurologist in New York City at Mount Sinai. And the title of this article is The Treatment of Amyotrophic Lateral Sclerosis with Vitamin E. So, so he's getting vitamin E injections. He's still traveling around with the team. He's not playing. The doc they find doctors in every city to give him these injections. And Dr. Wexler follows him as a subject in an experimental trial. Wexler publishes a, about 15 cases, uncontrolled, of course. And one of his cases is LG. Uh, that's how Lou Gehrig was identified in the article. And this is what he wrote about Gehrig's case uh, in uh, early 1940. Gehrig had been getting treated for a few months. LG was walking better. His muscles had stopped fibrillating, and his thumbs had gained power. The case of LG may be regarded as definitely arrested and somewhat improved. Now, you know, trying to play this back historically, knowing that vitamin E does nothing at all for amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, we can ask ourselves what was going on, and this is what I referred to at the beginning of the talk as one of the pitfalls of looking at individual cases. Now, we don't know, um, maybe Gehrig was sort of trying harder because he was in a trial, maybe Dr. Wexler was seeing things that really weren't there, the placebo effect, but whatever it was, the sense that Gehrig was getting better led to some excitement, both for Gehrig and the public, because this was announced to the public, but ultimately uh, did not prove to be of any value. Now, most people know the Lou Gehrig story from the movie, uh, Pride of the Yankees. Uh, I, you know, again, I got to, I rewatched it as I was working on the project. A, a real tearjerker, I warn you. Um, but one of the most interesting things about the film is the way it mixed fact and fiction. So even in 1942, when the film came out, Gary died in 1941, so the film comes out a year after he dies. Uh, they're already mythologizing Gary, and the actual details of his illness are much less important than the story behind it. So up top there is Gary Cooper, who played Gary, giving the famous luckiest man speech. Um, up here, Gehrig's giving the lucky man, Cooper as Gehrig. But this is a scene from the movie where the actual Babe Ruth, who plays himself in the movie with, with Gary Cooper as Lou Gehrig. So they're mixing fact and fiction from the, from the start. And uh, the quote that begins the movie is the following by the noted journalist and rock and Damon Runyon. He wrote, Lou Gehrig faced death with that same valor and fortitude that has been displayed by thousands of Americans on far-flung fields of battle, this obviously being during World War II. He left behind him a memory of courage and devotion that will ever be an inspiration to all men. This is the story of Lou Gehrig. Now, you know, that's the myth that was created um, that made people feel good about the story. The reality, as I've tried to suggest in Gehrig's case, unfortunately, was he was a very ordinary ALS patient. He did okay for a little while. He continued to go to a, a job at, where they got him in the city doing, uh, working with juvenile delinquents, actually quite a wonderful job, but eventually got worse, was bed bound, and, and died at home. Lived pretty much the average of what would have been expected for an ALS patient. John Foster Dulles. We're, we're jumping around here in history. We're going from sports to politics. You gotta keep paying attention. All right, John Foster Dulles. Um, Interesting case, not the most uh, unique case at all, but and again, uh, what, what I'll try to argue is sort of another path-breaking case for certain reasons. Dulles was the Secretary of State under Eisenhower, best known to uh, students of U.S. history as the father of the containment strategy for containing the Soviet Union, this being the era of the Cold War. Um, and Dulles, uh, in 1956, developed uh, acute abdominal pain uh, and was rushed from his home to Walter Reed Hospital uh, where he was initially felt to have appendicitis but later found to have a ruptured colon cancer. Now if you have, uh, for the medical people in the audience obviously know this, if you have a ruptured colon cancer 
1956, you're spreading cancer cells throughout your peritoneum. And there's no chemotherapy at this time, so Velas clearly has terminal cancer. Um, that does not come across in the newspapers, although Dulles, to his credit, is very open and is asked specifically, do you want us to keep the diagnosis of cancer secret, which was very common at the time. Dulles said people had the right to know. Ironically, Dulles himself was not told the extent of the cancer. But what was so interesting in his case was there were press conferences held. Now, Lou Gehrig, I showed you that one sort of press release. That's all Mayo Clinic did. They weren't. Gary, well, they weren't holding press conferences in, 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 uh, in the late 1930s. But by the 1950s, these sorts of illnesses are being seen much more as fair game. <coughs> Dulles is at uh, Walter Reed recovering from his surgery. And every morning, they hold a press conference in a room much like this. The doctors are in front. The reporters are in the audience asking questions. How is Mr. Dulles doing? Some of the more industrious reporters pushing for details about the medical condition. What the reporters didn't do, as far as I can tell though, and again, it's the 1950s, a different era, they did not go find oncologists or cancer specialists and ask what did they think of Dulles' prognosis. They, we weren't quite there yet, the reporters, still too deferential to authority. Uh, and so I put little media skepticism there. But anyone interested in the topic of colon cancer and what the treatments were and what the prognosis was would have gotten a lot of information from the newspaper coverage at that time. Okay, a little more obscure historical figure, but again, I, I think a, a landmark story. Um, Margaret Burke White, um, hopefully some of you are familiar with her photographs. I mean, a wonderful, probably the first famous woman photojournalist. Um, she uh, was uh, had a knack for being in the right place at the right time uh, as a photographer. She, it's a very famous picture she took at uh, Buchenwald concentration camp of the, of, of the liberation there. She was uh, with Mahatma Gandhi hours before he was assassinated <coughs> and took photos of him. So, you know, a, a jet-setting photojournalist who ironically, again, when it comes to the illness, developed what turned out to be Parkinson's disease. Now, um, she continued to work for a long time. She didn't see a doctor for a long time, as many celebrity patients are apt to do. She was in denial to some degree. But eventually she just couldn't work her camera right. She couldn't get to where she needed to go. And she saw a neurologist and was diagnosed uh, as having Parkinson's uh, with a tremor uh, and, you know, more or less sort of the typical uh, variety of the disease. Um, what, what Burke White did, again, sort of taking this yet to the next level, and I'll talk about the exact treatment she got in a minute, she went public with her case in the pages of Life magazine for whom she was a photographer, and she decided that people deserved to know what sort of treatment she was doing, even more so than Dulles. She was going to write an article in, in Life and let herself be photographed. Here she's getting physical therapy. Uh, and talk to the public about her disease and her treatment. So again, this elevates things again to the next level, I think. Now what were the treatments she was getting? They were pretty interesting. Um, Burke White initially was put on pills, which didn't work very well. Eventually found a doctor named Irving Cooper, a neurosurgeon, uh, in New York, who was doing an experimental procedure for Parkinson's that involved the purposeful ablation of part of the thalamus of the brain. Uh, incidentally, it had been found that patients with Parkinson's who had damage to part of the thalamus seemed to be able to move better and their tremor went away. So Cooper said, what if I purposely, carefully damage the thalamus and see how that works with Parkinson's patients. Burke White, very involved in learning about her disease, very optimistic about this, signs up for the procedure. She gets it done on one side of her brain in 1959, the other side in 1961. Uh, as I suggested, and I'll show you in a minute, she again becomes a, a spokesperson for the disease. I'll show you a couple letters she received in a minute. Um, one of the interesting issues, though, with Burke White was what I put down here as the issue of proof. Did her surgery work or not? Um, 
she, the first operation, she seemed to get better afterwards. She went for rehabilitation afterwards, she went for physical therapy, she wrote enthusiastically to family members that this had been almost curative, she was praising Dr. Cooper to everyone who was writing her. After a few months though, it seemed like she was more or less back where she started. Um, but she had enough confidence in the operation to get it done on the other side a couple years later. That operation clearly did nothing and, and perhaps even worsened her condition because it was brain surgery and, and it didn't work. Um, so she very much struggled with this exact issue that I mentioned of how do you find out if you're one patient and you have a chronic disease, how do you know if the thing that you picked influenced your disease? Much like Gary, you know, it first looked like it was helping uh, and she struggled very much with that same issue as well. But I, I would argue that in Burke White's case, as in so many of these celebrity cases, the actual medical improvement or not improvement that occurred mattered less than the in inspiring role or the, or the role model aspect that these patients played for other people struggling with the same disease. So I'll just read two of the many, many quotations I found written to Burke White. Uh, one was written by a wife of a man with Parkinson's. We were so thrilled to see him hear you on TV, we just cried. Chad didn't think I saw him, but he wiped his nose and eyes. And another Parkinson's patient himself. The doctors here say there is no cure, but your story made me believe there is some help and hope. Okay. Now we're going to t into that second group of patients. Uh, to remind you, we're now up into the 1970s. These were the people who were also famous, but not only uh, told their stories publicly, but also began to challenge a system. Uh, and not surprising, this happens in the 1970s. That's really the beginnings of the, what we would call sort of the modern patient activism movement, bioethics. Um, and that occurs at a time of a lot of social turmoil in the United States civil rights movement, Vietnam War protests, feminism, and all these things coalesced to create a mood in medicine as well where doctors, I think, were really being challenged for the first time. And you'll see some of the patients here that took their doctors on as they struggled with their public illnesses. Um, first is Morris Aber, and I, 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 I always tell this joke. Uh, when I was preparing the book and, and deciding who would go in the book and who wouldn't, which is actually sort of an interesting question, um, and my wife was like, so who are you putting in and who are you not? And I listed all the people and, and, I'm, and, and, and I said, I'm putting Morris Aberman. Now, it just so happens where I'm speaking today, most people would, would know Morris Aberman, the southern lawyer, he was from Georgia. Um, my wife was like, he's not famous, you know, you, you can't put him in the book. But, but I had to put him in because the story is, again, one of these transition stories and he was really one of the earliest people whose cases you will see goes public who really pushed the agenda in a very interesting way. Now, Abram, again, a civil rights lawyer, Jewish, born in rural Georgia, I, I think would have agreed with the characterization. He was born like with a chip on his shoulder and, and, and channeled this into his life work as a civil rights lawyer representing African Americans. Uh, when he developed AML in 1973, he was already 55 years old. Uh, he went to see a hematologist who said, this is bad. Uh, I think the hematologist said he had about a 10% chance of surviving five years. He said, this is an incurable disease. I'm really sorry. Um, and as doctors often said in those days, um, we're going to treat you, but you should get your affairs in order. Words you don't want to hear. Um, Abram, from the get-go, uh, refuse to accept this uh, this decision. So he was what we might call defiantly optimistic, and his family corroborated this, um, and he wrote in his writings at the time, he's like, I'm gonna beat this. Okay, now how did he plan to beat this? Okay, so uh, Morris Aver may be the first patient in the history of American medicine who insisted that his doctor put a hand-washing sign on his door. Um, and you know now we go in now whether we do it or not is, is another problem. But every patient's got you know the signs and there's the bacterial stuff all over the hospital. Um, Abram learned that he was going to get chemotherapy for his AML and that 
we learned that doctors don't, and not just doctors, all health professionals come in the room, they don't wash your hands, and you're going to be prone to infection. So he said, I don't want anyone entering my room unless they wash their hands. He also was well known at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York for refusing to ever go in a wheelchair to his tests, right? They were like, come on, we have to just go in the wheelchair. He's like, I can walk. And, and this sort of thing, over and over and over. Continued, scheduled his chemotherapy when he wasn't in court and continued to work the whole time. You get the picture. More interestingly though, from a medical perspective, he pushed the doctors in interesting ways. So Abram learned that there was, uh, the good news was that AML was now being treated with a regimen called 5 plus 3, a more aggressive chemotherapeutic regimen than before. So that was good but the prognosis still was poor. So he did research himself and found out that doctors at that very hospital were at the very early stages of using two uh, experimental strategies that we would call immunotherapy. Um, one involved the treatment of leukemic cells with an enzyme and reinfusion of them back into the body. Another was derived from the BCG vaccine. But both of them were, had the same idea. They were going to boost the immune system of the person with leukemia and help him, him fight the disease and, and hopefully work together with the chemotherapy. Uh, so uh, Abram uh, is first told, I'm sorry, these are experimental protocols. We're not really ready to do this yet. And he basically bullied uh, the doctors into giving him these off protocol, both of them. So he's getting two immunotherapy treatments that were very toxic. One involved injections of substance into 50 lymph nodes once a month, plus chemotherapy. Um, typical quote from Abram to his one of his oncologists, I do not want a day to pass the administration of that immunotherapy on account of administrative problems. So, you know, you get rid of it. Okay. Fast forward, that was 1973 when he's diagnosed. Fast forward four years ahead. The front page of the New York Times, August 15th, 1977. Noted lawyer free of symptoms four years after getting leukemia. Okay. Uh, among Abram's other jobs uh, in his career was being the president of Brandeis University. Uh, Prene Gupte was an undergraduate there. Uh, when he was writing to the New York Times, found out through the grapevine that Abram had survived seemingly incurable leukemia uh, and asked Abram if he would be willing to tell his story. Abram was, and hence the article. Now, what did this article say? All right, well, you know, you interview Morris Abram and you don't really ask anybody else. Uh, this is what the article said. Uh, he cured himself by his will and uh, don't read the quotes yet. He, that Abram basically cured himself by his will and challenging the doctor. So Abram, you know, he said, look, uh, and, and by the way, completely, one of Abram's doctors, James Holland, you know, one of the most famous hematologists, Abram worshipped his doctors, don't get me wrong, but he just, you know, he just bullied them and, and, and fought with them all the time. But he told the story, I was given a death sentence, and I made sure I wasn't going to die, and I had the will to do this, and I, I worked hard with my doctors, I pushed my doctors, and that's why I survived leukemia. Uh, and again, um, Abram generates a lot of appreciative letters. If Morris Abram can do it, I can at least try, writes another leukemia patient, and I cannot and will not accept the opinion that there is little or nothing to be done. Um, Abram, uh, by the way, lives uh, till I think the year 2000 survives for 25 years, dies in his 80s of, of an infection. Um, we can maybe talk later about why he, why he may have survived it. Okay, even my wife couldn't object to this. Okay, Steve McQueen. Uh, all right, with his typically salty language. Um, I, I, I throw this quote up here because uh, I challenge you whether this was said by Steve McQueen after he learned he had mesothelioma or in any single movie he was in. <laughs> I think the answer is yes to all of the above. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk about that blurring effect in fiction in a minute. Okay, McQueen, 1979, uh, sick again, you know, sad story, sick for a year before, coughing, actually gets a lung biopsy earlier on, it's, it's negative, they missed the mesothelioma, 
had worked, uh, was in the Marines, had worked around asbestos, was a smoker. Um, 1979, he's finally diagnosed with mesothelioma cancer of the lining of the lungs. Uh, gets standard, first goes to Cedar sinai in, in L.A., gets standard therapy, of which wasn't very good, involving mostly cobalt radiation. Doesn't slow the progression of the disease. And McQueen is very much told, get your affairs in order. Now, uh, what McQueen does in, a, in an era before the internet is look for alternative approaches. So McQueen is going to veer out of orthodox medicine, and he's going to be the first major celebrity to do this and really talk about it publicly. What does he do? Uh, he travels to Mexico for alternative treatment. He learns that, and this is, again, one of these crazy stories, and it's true, an orthodontist from Texas um, who had cured his own liver and pancreatic cancer with a complicated series of enzymes, vitamins, coffee enemas, uh, laetrile, which was made from apricot pits and was the anti-cancer substance of the era. Uh, this doctor uh, felt he, had, this orthodontist felt he cured himself, knew he couldn't do this in the United States, went to Mexico, started a hospital there, got doctors to work with him, and McQueen finds out about this and travels down to Mexico in early 1980 um, where he starts undergoing this very unorthodox treatment, again, of, of all those things that I told you. Um, now again, a, a note about McQueen's movies, if you ever watch them, um, you know, he, he really played a rebel in, in all his movies and he died in some of the movies, but he survived in many, and even the ones he died in, he was the hero, right? The Great Escape, uh, Bullet, I, I mean, all, you know, all these movies, he, that, that's very much the role he had. And, you know, in a sense, it was hard not to read into his story of his cancer that it was almost as if when he was told he had six months to live that he became one of his film characters and, and, and said, I, I refuse to accept this and, and acted like he might have in a movie trying to find a possible cure. Now. What happened uh, in October of 1980 was very interesting. Uh, McQueen is still down in Mexico. His doctors tell him he's getting better. He's been down at this clinic for a few months. They're, he's told his tumors are shrinking uh, and he's getting better. Uh, it is decided to hold a press conference in uh, Los Angeles because the National Enquirer found out that McQueen was down in Mexico getting these treatments. And once that went public, the LA Times picked up on it, it was a public story, and McQueen decided to give his version of the story, which was through some of his doctors who went up to LA and a press conference is held. It is announced at that press conference that Steve McQueen was, cu was being cured of his mesothelioma through this complicated mixture of alternative treatments that he was receiving in Mexico. There's enormous publicity, enormous excitement. Um, unfortunately, uh, two months later, McQueen, and the story is very complicated, but apparently there was a one tumor mass that hadn't responded, that was pushing on something, they decide to do surgery, they remove it successfully, but then he dies a few hours after the operation. Uh, the autopsy reports that I read that seemed to be the most reliable said there was cancer all over his body. So it's very unlikely that he had really experienced any success from this treatment whatsoever. However, the story was told, and if you look at the, uh, the biographies written of McQueen afterwards, he had almost beaten his cancer except that he died from a complication of the operation. And that is how the story was told over and over and over. That was the myth. And most importantly, thousands of people followed Steve, with end-stage cancer followed Steve McQueen. I, I was able to find some CBS News reports of people in the year or so afterwards in Mexico down there getting the exact same treatment. They had nothing, they'd been told there was nothing else to offer. The irony presuming that, that they're not adding any years to their life, they're spending their month, last months away from their families and they're spending a huge amount. Okay, we move for the last uh, 10 minutes into the third group that I talked about. And these were the non-famous people who became famous as a result of their illnesses. Now you'll see some similarities with the previous group. Um, the media is going to play a big role in all these cases. Uh, there's a lot of challenging in the medical establishment. Again, these are going to be cases from 
70s, 80s, and 90s. Uh, interestingly, uh, in many of these instances, as, as I'm sure all of you know in the audience, if you become involved in a, uh, it, as an advocate for a specific disease, one of the things you want to do is find a celebrity with a disease so you can get enough attention. Um, there is an effort uh, to raise money to fund research for these particular diseases. And as I'll talk about at the end, these are very much become these end of one stories again where just what went on in these individual cases versus what would go on in a population of patients with the same disease becomes very hard to tell. Okay, so again, nobody knew Barney Clark uh, until uh, December of 1982. Now Clark was a uh, dentist. He was from Utah. He was a Mormon. Uh, he was living in Seattle and he had end-stage congestive heart failure. Very, you know, EEF of ejection fraction of about 10 to 15 percent, short of breath on pretty much any activity he could do. He went up to Utah where his family had told him that the University of Utah was doing research into a totally artificial heart. Uh, very early experimental stages. He went up, he met with the doctors. He wasn't so bad at the time. He went and toured the animal laboratory where there were sheep and other animals, goats, walking around with artificial hearts, some that live 200 days or more, um, and uh, saw those animals. Clark at that time says, you know, I, I'm not interested now, I'm, I'm okay. Gets worse a couple months later and contacts the doctors and says, I'm ready to have the first artificial heart. And uh, complicated and in, 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 in many ways a very sad story, and as I'll suggest, Again, the rise of bioethics in this era, Clark becomes one of the first sort of seminal cases in the world of bioethics. Now what happened with Barney Clark uh, was intense, intense media scrutiny. Now why was that? Um, I, I take you back to the Mayo Clinic that issued a press release, Walter Reed Hospital had morning press conferences. When Barney Clark was about to get his artificial heart, the press office at the University of Utah put out a press release to everyone in the media, come to the University of Utah. I mean, enormous confidence, excitement about this technology, what it could achieve. So, uh, not accidental that this becomes an enormously important media case. As you can see, cover of both Time and Newsweek, and I could show you dozens and dozens of similar images. Now, how did Clark do? Um, he uh, survived the operation which went for about 12 hours. Um, and there's a very uh, sort of famous line that happens when he goes basically from being blue to pink, right? He's, his, his blood gets oxygenated for the first time with, and his heart is out and he's got a piece of, of plastic and aluminum and, and polyurethane in his heart that is his heart attached to a, through a tube to a 300 pound generator that's pumping the blood in his body. And he opens his eyes and wakes up and smiles at his wife. And, you know, it's an incredibly moving experience for everybody involved. Um, unfortunately, soon after that, he began a teetering course uh, and was not doing well. Many complications, he had to go back to the OR four times. Um, he spent much of the four months in a state, what we might call delirium. Uh, for times he was acutely depressed, uh, wanted to die, expressed suicidal wishes. Um, very challenging, very hard for the family who I interviewed for the book. Uh, very difficult. Um, however, there were periods of time where he was up and walking around and getting physical therapy. Um, and so it was very hard to, to, to process what was going on here. Um, now, the bioethicists, as I suggested, latched onto this case. They thought this was terrible, that um, he had not really uh, given true informed consent, that he'd been rushed into an experimental procedure that worked on animals but wasn't ready for humans, and that he'd experienced 112 days of torment. So this became sort of a a cause celebre of, of the early bioethicists saying, um, you know, this is wrong, this, this, this man was pushed too early too soon. But the public perception of the case, almost exactly the opposite. Um, 
And again, a couple of quotes. Um, this was someone who wrote to Unaloy Clark, Barney Clark's widow, after he died, after 112 days. I lost a brother to heart disease and suffer from a serious heart problem myself. Dr. Clark has given us all hope. Um, and then I, I just put down this quote from the Associated Press in 2001. This is one of many quotes you can find about Barney Clark on the internet these days. Barney Clark was a pioneer in medical history who blazed the medical trail. He's in like all sorts of medical hall of fames on, on the internet. Uh, the story of the torment that he went through for 112 days has basically been disappeared. Uh, and it's just a story of a man with an artificial heart who strove to live and was a hero to others. So again, the myth overtook the real story. Um, a word about AIDS, uh, and then I'll do my last case. Um, AIDS, in a sense, changed everything. Although you see some of what happened in the world of AIDS beginning to percolate out in the cases of Morris Abram and Stephen Queen. Um, AIDS uh, did a few things. One was it brought more celebrities out who had a devastating illness, a couple of them being Magic Johnson and Rock Hudson. A couple others that I talk about in the book are Arthur Ashe and Elizabeth Glazer. Uh, but mostly what it did is it got activism on the front of American newspapers. This is the group ACT UP um, that was particularly active in New York City and San Francisco, pushing the doctors for uh, research trials. Get people with AIDS who are dying uh, and not and there were no treatments available. Can't we get into research trials? Pushing and pushing. And the idea was if you were right in front of the cameras and you were pushing for this sort of thing, you were enhancing your case, which is a perfect lead into the last case. And that is of Lorenzo Adone. So how many folks have seen the movie Lorenzo's Oil? OK. Um, even though I'm about to tell you how much of the movie is fiction, I still recommend you watch it. It's extraordinarily well done and, and, and very moving. And there's a lot of truth, actually, in it. Um, I call this the apotheosis of patient activism. Um, you'll see what the Adone family did um, to push uh, the envelope for what a newly famous patient could do in the world of medical discovery. So ALD, uh, again, I, and it's in an interesting way, I bracketed my stories. I start the book with ALS and Lou Gehrig, a, a terrible neurological disease, and then we end with ALD, a terrible neurological disease. Uh, ALD is a progressive neurological disorder, and I'll show you a, a, a diagram in a minute, um, that is X-linked. It affected young boys, transmitted uh, through the mother who was asymptomatic. Basically, uh, boys got it between ages 5 and 10, if they were predisposed. It began um, as Lorenzo's case often did. He was in school, he was just starting kindergarten, dropping things in school, acting strange, um, getting into fights with kids, and he was, by all accounts, an extraordinarily precocious child. His father was Italian. Uh, Augusto Adone, the family was living in Europe. He could, uh, Lorenzo could already speak French, Italian, and English by the time he was five. Um, his mother, neither the father or the mother, by the way, were medical people. His mother was Michaela Adone. Um, and they were extraordinarily perturbed at what was happening to their son. At first they said, you, they just moved back to the United States. This was an adjustment disorder. He was acting out, but finally gets worse and worse. They take him to one neurologist. They missed the diagnosis. Finally, he's diagnosed with ALD um, in 1983. He's, again, five years old, going on six. Um, some of what I alluded to already, um, it's a disease of myelin degeneration. Um, basically, the myelin, which is the protective sheaths of the nerves, degenerate all over the body. So that's why he was dropping things. That's why he was acting uh, strangely. Gradually, as more and more of the nerves start to work, uh, these boys cannot eat anymore. They can't hear. They can't see. They become bed bound. They have to be fed by tubes and they gradually die. Just a, a horrible, horrible disease, um, again. Uh, caused, um, we now know, by the buildup of very long chain fatty acids in the blood, which basically were toxic. Um, this would be, uh, you know, the mom who's the carrier, and that would be Lorenzo if that was the family who's a family. Okay, this is gonna ring similarly to some of the other stories I told about. Pa parents told, He's going to die. They refuse to accept the fate. They challenge the doctors like Abram. Now, what did they do? 
uh, it happened that the Adone family was living in suburban Washington, D.C., right near the NIH. They basically became fixtures at the National Institutes of Health Library, where they began to research everything they could find about ALD and other diseases of myelin, basically. Uh, they found that there were scientists all over the globe working on this topic who had never met one another. Um, they got money to bring them all together for a scientific conference, the first conference on ALD, and got people in the room talking with one another. And just from that very first conference, they learned that someone was already experimenting with oleic acid and oil, putting it into the cells of, of boys, the ALD cells from boys where they got the disease. And it seemed maybe to uh, lower the fatty acid levels in those cells. Again, very, very preliminary. Long story short, family begets very involved. Um, first, they say, what if we fed Lorenzo oleic acid? Because it seems like this works and the doctors don't have anything else. Now the doctors were like, you can't do this, that's crazy. We, you know, this is like a, a cells and a test. But the Adonis push forward, they find a safe version of oleic acid. They feed it to Lorenzo. His abnormal, very long chain fatty acid levels come down. They do more research. They conclude that what's going on is competitive inhibition of an enzyme that's causing abnormal buildup of long chain fatty acids. They hypothesize, this is the father, that if you could under, put a second uh, acid in there into the diet, you could lower the fatty chain levels to normal. The one they find is something called erucic acid. They mix the two together. They make it into salad dressing, feed it to Lorenzo, and his levels go down to zero. Now, unfortunately, Lorenzo was already severely ill by this point. He was bed-bound. He was not very responsive, although it depended who you asked. Um, uh, could hear, could not see, could not eat by himself, could not take care of himself whatsoever. Um, but he starts getting the oil. Now, uh, at a few years later, now the story starts to get out in the media, right? Uh, this is happening in the late 1980s. By the early 1990s, it's known that a family in suburban Maryland is feeding their son this acid that the doctors thought they should do. And a filmmaker named George Miller, who's uh, from New Zealand, who actually went to medical school and never practiced, hears about the story uh, and, and does the movie Lorenzo Zola. Now, this is about as far away from a documentary as you could ever find. He only talks to the Adone family. He doesn't really talk to the doctors. It's again one of these movies that blurs fact and fiction. The names in the movie, he uses the actual names of the Adones, but he changes the names of the doctors. Um, uh, Nick Nolte plays the father, Susan Sarandon plays the mother, uh, but they are the Adones, and it's told, the story is told from the perspective of the Adone family, and it's very much told, as George Miller <coughs> says, as a story of heroism and triumph. The purpose in telling this story is to provide a manual of courageous conduct. And that's what the movie is. And so the myth then becomes that these are the heroic Adone, this is the heroic Adone family who took on the doctors and cured their son because of this. And that's implied in the movie because there are scenes that are invented that did not happen that celebrate the Adones. Um, and one of them most dramatically being at the end of the movie when a large number of boys are filmed in the camera, running, doing all these sports. They run up to the camera and they say, my name is so-and-so, I've been taking Lorenzo's oil for three years. And then they run away and they go play sports. And it's this extraordinarily moving depiction. There was no data out yet that this was doing anything. You, they knew it lowered the fatty, uh, long-chain fatty acid levels, but nobody knew if it cured the disease or prevented anything. But this was the movie that was made. Again, the myth becoming so important. Um, I will tell you, we now know, and the data eventually got published, that unfortunately, the oil does very little for boys like Lorenzo who had uh, the disease uh, in general. It just can't reverse very much. But if you are genetically predisposed and you begin to take the oil and you take it regularly, uh, it prevents the onset of the disease in upwards of two-thirds of cases. So a quite a remarkable discovery. Okay, let me conclude, uh, and then we can talk. Okay, 
So the press, uh, I have hoped I've convinced you, has eagerly covered celebrity cases as a way to publicize diseases and medical advances. Celebrity activists, uh, I, I've argued, have successfully used the media to raise attention and funding for research. So at the same time, the press and the public has benefited from uh, the, the celebrity cases. The celebrities have wisely, when it's, innate, when it's helped them, have used the media themselves. But uh, there have been some downsides, as I've suggested. Media coverage has often simplified complicated cases, as I've suggested. Uh, particularly in the realm of experimentation, these celebrities have undergone experimental treatments that have been touted early on that have proven not to be of value. And I think that there is often a mistaken assumption that one can, quote, follow in the footsteps of celebrity patients. I actually got that exact quote from someone with Parkinson's talking about Michael J. Fox, who said, I'm going to follow in his footsteps. They wanted to like, take the same medications and see the same doctor. And as we know, that can be very perilous. Uh, a bit about that issue of proof that I've been talking about throughout the talk. As I suggested at the beginning, in the same time period, the 1940s to the present, that we've seen this rise of interest in celebrity cases, we've seen the rise of evidence-based medicine. And that one of the tenets of evidence-based medicine is don't you dare look at anecdotal cases. They don't tell you anything. You don't learn a thing from those cases. You need to do good clinical studies, ideally randomized controlled trials that follow groups of patients prospectively that have good controls, and even better, meta-analyses that bring together a large number of randomized controlled trials and really get to the truth of what happens with patients with these diseases. And I would be the first to say that we need good randomized data for making clinical health policy and fundraising decisions. However, as I've tried to suggest, I think we should not, in an era of evidence-based medicine, disdain N of 1 cases. Uh, as I've shown, the public, uh, people with diseases, their family, the general public, is not only interested in, quote, the best data when they get sick. Now, they hopefully are trying to process, with using, working with their doctors, to what to, to learn what they should do that might be the best thing from a medical perspective, but they're also interested in stories, stories they've heard about famous people, stories from their family, stories indeed from their own medical past. Um, so it's important, I think, to remember how famous people, their cases are remembered for how they fought illness and become symbols of hope regardless of the outcome of their disease. Um, and yeah, just to mention that these famous people can, you know, they may not be uh, celebrities, they can be famous and friends. And uh, anecdotes can be very real to people, again, despite evidence-based medicine. And I do like this quote at the bottom, as I suggested, society's myths are not what is false, but what is most true. Okay, two pictures and then we'll stop. Um, I'd like to put this picture uh, up. That's Lorenzo. Uh, in his late 20s with Augusto Adone, I had the privilege to meet both of them writing, working on the project. Um, this is uh, Augusto interacting with Lorenzo. Now, when I saw Lorenzo uh, that day that I was down there, he certainly was not interacting with me at all. He was lying in a reclining chair. He had a feeding tube in his nose. He was still very much getting Lorenzo's oil. Um, However, his father um, felt that he could interact with Lorenzo, enjoyed music, enjoyed hearing his talking, uh, and had meaningful interaction. And certainly to the degree that Lorenzo bucked the odds and lived uh, almost till age 30, died about a year or two ago, with ALD, uh, it was clearly because he was the very first person to get Lorenzo's oil. And, uh, you know, the list is endless. But I, I just put these folks up here, uh, some of the newer cases, since I've talked a lot about old cases. Uh, cases of celebrity patients are ongoing, and the, the lessons are still being taught. Um, these recent cases, though, I think uh, diverged a little bit from some of what I've talked about, uh, and I sort of call it the new candor here. Uh, these were all uh, the, the three folks with cancer on the left, Patrick Swayze, Ted Kennedy, and Elizabeth Edwards, were all people who went public with not just cancer, but metastatic cancer, uh, and admitted that they were going to die of their diseases. Uh, and it was interesting the way that the media covered that, both 
talking about that but covering it up at the same time and being very optimistic. But I, I think it's safe to say there's been sort of a new candor about some of these cases. And uh, both Michael J. Fox and Muhammad Ali with Parkinson's would also fall into that category. I think if people saw uh, when Michael J. Fox several years ago was on TV um, around that whole interview thing with Rush Limbaugh and, and was he was supporting presidential candidate and was on TV whoops, with a uh, with a very bad tremor and was having a, a bad day with respect to his medications. That was an incredible moment on TV. Again, something you really wouldn't have seen even 10 or 20 years ago. Um, so anyway, uh, dying patients I think are more public these days. The internet puts these stories out there right away, but I would still caution us to beware of partial stories. And I will stop there. Thank you so much.